Newborn Exam by Dr. Nina Gold. This video will introduce you to the key aspects of the newborn physical exam with a focus on normal physical findings versus those that might suggest a congenital anomaly or genetic condition. When you enter the room, congratulate the family and introduce yourself. Explain that you would like to examine their infant and ask if you have come at a convenient time. If the family agrees to an exam, carefully place the infant on her back and unswaddle her from any blankets. Make a general observation of your patient. Is she asleep or awake? Is her skin warm or cool to the touch? Are her vital signs within normal range? Is she having any difficulty breathing? If you note any signs of distress or illness, end the physical exam here and notify the supervising resident or attending physician. If the baby looks well but is crying, console her by laying your hand on her head or offering a pacifier if the parents allow. Proceed with the individual aspects of your exam. The simplest way to examine a newborn is from head to toe. By using the same method during each exam, you will be unlikely to leave out important steps. Head. Gently place a hand behind the posterior portion or occiput of the skull. Measure the head circumference in centimeters by wrapping a measuring tape in a circle just above her eyebrows to the most prominent aspect of the occiput and back again. Determine if her head is of normal size by plotting the circumference on a newborn growth chart. The head circumference should be in the average range for infants of the same gestational age and also fall approximately in the same percentile as the infant's length and weight. Next, what is the shape of your patient's head? A newborn skull is made up of several bony plates that meet along flexible cranial sutures. In the center, they form a soft spot known as the anterior fontanelle. There is also a smaller fontanelle in the back, the posterior fontanelle. The first letters of the cranial suture and fontanelle spell out the word clams. C is for coronal suture, L is for lambdoid suture, A is for anterior fontanelle, M is for metopic suture, S is for sagittal suture. This design allows the skull to be malleable enough to fit through the birth canal, which often leads to a temporary deformation called molding. Check the infant's skull for bruising and swelling. A bruise that doesn't cross the suture lines is called a cephalohematoma, which is caused by bleeding below the periosteum and is more common in births assisted by a vacuum or forceps. These infants are at increased risk of jaundice due to the breakdown of hemoglobin as the bruise resolves. If the swelling crosses suture lines, it is most commonly due to a caput succedaneum, a fluid accumulation that forms above the periosteum due to the force of delivery. The swelling typically resolves within a few days of birth. Rarely, you may see more extensive swelling that crosses suture lines due to the rupture of emissary veins. This is called a subgaleal hemorrhage and can lead to more serious complications due to significant blood loss in a large potential space. Finally, run your fingers over the skin of the infant's scalp. If you feel any areas where the skin is missing or has an unusual texture, it may be a sign of cutis aplasia, a congenital anomaly in which the scalp has not formed properly. This finding is not inherently dangerous, but should prompt a thorough examination for other atypical physical features. Face. After gathering a general impression, begin your examination of each individual facial feature. First, assess the ears. To check the ear placement, imagine a straight line drawn from the outer corner of the eye. The upper portion of the ear should meet this line. If not, the ears may be considered low set. Now imagine a second line, drawn perpendicular to the first. Is the infant's ear straight along this axis? If it is tilted back, the ear may be in a posterior rotation. An atypical ear position is not dangerous, but may prompt consideration for an underlying genetic condition. Next, assess ear formation. Do the ears have a complete rim of skin surrounding them, called the helix? Does the skin inside the helix, called the crus, have folds, or is it unusually smooth? Finally, check the skin beside the ear's tragus for pits and skin tags. While variation in ear formation can be normal, the presence of one of these minor variants may be associated with some genetic conditions, as well as hearing loss or anomalies of the kidneys, the development of which are controlled by some of the same genes as the ears. Now check the infant's eyes, again beginning with an inspection. Do they appear widely spaced? Does the opening of the eye, called the palpebral fissure, point upwards or downwards? Subtle variations in eye spacing and rotation are normal and may be inherited from healthy parents. To check the infant's pupils, 
you may have to coax her to open her eyes by turning off the lights or cupping your hand over her eyelids. When she opens them, quickly assess the infant's red reflex by shining the ophthalmoscope light on the eye. You should see a flash of red in each eye, indicating the normal presence of retinal vessels in the eye. If you see an asymmetric red reflex, particularly if the color seen is white, you may have detected a retinal anomaly, such as a congenital cataract or a retinoblastoma. Another atypical finding is called a coloboma, which are missing pieces of tissue in the structure that form the eye. A patient with either of these findings should be referred to both ophthalmology and medical genetics for further evaluation. Next, we examine the nose. In the newborn, the most important feature to assess is patency of the nares, as neonates are preferential nasal breathers. If there is any history of respiratory distress or noisy breathing when feeding or crying, patency can be proven by passing a small French catheter through each nares. It is common for newborns to have transient obstruction from edema related to suctioning after birth, but the differential also includes coanal atresia or coanal stenosis, an improper formation or narrowing of the nasal airways. Coanal atresia is a characteristic finding of the genetic condition CHARGE syndrome, which is an acronym for coloboma of the eye, heart abnormalities, atresia of the coana, retardation of growth or development, genitourinary abnormalities, and ear abnormalities. Any infant found to have coanal atresia should be referred to an ear, nose, and throat specialist, as well as a medical geneticist. The final features of the face you will examine are the mouth and jaw. Gently insert your gloved index finger into the newborn's mouth. A healthy baby will reflexively suck on the glove. In the anterior portion of the mouth, you will feel the hard palate. As your finger travels backwards, you will feel the soft palate. A division or cleft in the hard palate or lip may be easy to detect by inspection. Clefts in the soft palate, however, are more difficult to observe by eye. A patient with a cleft palate or cleft lip should be referred to an ear, nose, and throat specialist and may need special help with feeding. Cleft palate is commonly an isolated congenital anomaly, but can also be associated with other medical conditions. Next, assess her tongue. Is she able to elevate her tongue and push it past the lower gums? If not, she may have ankyloglossia, more commonly known as tongue tie. This finding is a minor variant and is not a sign of a genetic condition, but could impair the infant's ability to breastfeed. A phrenotomy or release of the frenulum may be indicated if breastfeeding is painful or inefficient. Finally, do a brief overall examination of the infant's mouth, looking for other unusual findings such as a natal tooth. Neck. Note if there is obvious webbing of the neck or redundant skin, which can be found in Turner syndrome or Noonan syndrome. Now, run your fingers over the infant's collarbones. The clavicles should feel smooth without any crepitus, breaks, or step-offs. Fractures of the clavicle may occur during delivery, particularly in infants who had shoulder dystocia. Chest. Inspect the shape of the chest. Does the sternum lie flat, or is it concave, called a pectus excavatum, or convex, called a pectus carinatum? While these findings are more common in some connective tissue and cardiac disorders, such as Marfan syndrome, an isolated pectus abnormality is considered a minor variant and is not cause for genetics referral. Listen to the baby's heart. You will use the same landmarks for auscultation as you would when examining an older child or adult. A normal newborn heart rate is between 120 to 160 beats per minute, making the cardiac exam a challenge. You may need to listen for up to a minute before you can clearly make out the sounds of systole and diastole. Many newborns have a continuous machine-like murmur caused by the closing of the patent ductus arteriosus. This murmur is benign and in a full-term infant should resolve within the first few days of life. Other heart murmurs, particularly those that do not improve within days, should be further evaluated. The first steps to undertake when investigating a newborn heart murmur include obtaining pre- and post-ductal oxygen saturations, four extremity blood pressures, and an EKG. Assess the infant's respiration. It is normal for infants to take short pauses in their breathing or breathe at a slightly irregular rate. This is called periodic breathing and sometimes takes new parents by surprise. Auscultate along the apex of the lungs and around their sides and back. The lungs should sound equally loud with clear passage of air and no wheezes or crackles. A newborn respiratory rate is 30 to 60 breaths per minute. Abdomen. First, inspect the abdomen. 
Is it distended? The skin around the umbilical cord should look clean and dry. Many infants have an outpouching of skin around the umbilicus called an umbilical hernia. Evaluate whether an umbilical hernia is reducible by gently pushing it back toward the abdomen. A hernia that feels firm or is stuck in place may be incarcerated and should be evaluated by a surgical specialist. Next, palpate the infant's abdomen by placing one hand on top of the other. Push gently. On the right side of the abdomen, assess the size of the liver. The liver edge should either not be palpable or lie very close to the newborn's ribs. Palpate around the abdomen, carefully assessing for masses. While rare, some infants may have intraabdominal neoplasms, such as a neuroblastoma or a Wilms tumor. Groin. Unfasten the infant's diaper. Assess the femoral pulses by placing your fingers along the crease between the thigh and the diaper area. Don't push too hard. It may take several minutes before you can feel a steady pulse on both sides. If you are unable to find the pulse or it feels very weak on one side, you may have identified an aortic coarctation. This can be further investigated by measuring pre- and post-ductal oxygen saturations and four-extremity blood pressures. At this time, you may also check for the presence of an inguinal hernia. Now, evaluate the genitalia. In an infant with female genitalia, the labia and clitoris may appear engorged as a result of maternal hormones. Some newborns even experience a small amount of vaginal discharge or bleeding. Another common finding is vaginal skin tags on the posterior forechecked. In an infant with male genitalia, assess if the testicles are descended by palpating them through the scrotum. A swollen and large scrotum is usually indicative of a hydrocele or a fluid collection around the testes which will spontaneously resolve. Examine the penis for any abnormal curvatures and that the foreskin fully covers the glands. Hooded foreskin is often indicative of hypospadias or the ventral displacement of the urethral meatus. In all infants, assess the patency of the anus by using one hand to hold the legs and the other to gently spread apart the gluteal cleft. Replace the infant's diaper. You will now assess the infant's hips to test for hip dysplasia. Hip dysplasia is a congenital deformation or misalignment of the hip joint and is more common in infants who have a family history of hip dysplasia, are female, or who had a breech presentation in utero. Assess the hips one at a time using two maneuvers. In the Barlow maneuver, first adduct the hip by bringing the thigh toward the midline. Then apply a gentle posterior pressure to the knee. In the Ortolani maneuver, flex the infant's knees to a 90 degree position, then abduct the legs by folding the thigh outwards. If you feel a clunk or dislocation, close follow-up should be arranged with the primary care physician or an orthopedic surgeon, depending on the severity of the finding. All neonates with risk factors should have a hip ultrasound at four to six weeks of life, regardless of a normal hip exam. Extremities. Are there 10 fingers and 10 toes? Many infants have a small nubbin of skin attached to the exterior of the fifth finger. This is a normal finding and may have been inherited. What about the length of the digits? Do the fingers appear short, called brachiodactyly, or long, called arachnodactyly? Next, assess the palms. A lone horizontal crease in the palm is called a single transverse palmar crease. While this minor variant is more common in infants with neurologic conditions such as Down syndrome, it is also found in about 1% of the general population. A minor variant in hand morphology should not prompt referral to genetics unless it is one finding among a constellation of others. Major anomalies of the hands or feet, however, such as missing or extra digits, should prompt further investigation. Back. Now gently turn the infant over to inspect her back. It is common for infants to have blue-gray macules on their back that fade over time. You may see other normal newborn rashes, such as erythema toxicum, which look like pustules on an erythematous base, and appear between 24 to 48 hours of life. A look at the sacral area. If you see a dimple there, Check if you can clearly visualize the base of the indentation. If you cannot, the infant may have a spinal cord abnormality known as a tethered cord or spina bifida occulta. Other findings concerning for a spinal cord abnormality are a conspicuous patch of hair on the lower back or an asymmetric gluteal cleft. Neurologic. The baby's mental status can be described as awake or asleep, irritable or calm, consolable or inconsolable. To test her muscle tone, pull her toward you. Does her potty feel stiff and hypertonic or overly floppy and hypotonic? Does her head come up with her body to a sitting position or does it lag behind? You can assess her motor function by observation. Does she move all her extremities well? Is her face symmetric? 
Sensation can be determined by noticing how she responds to your touch. A unique aspect of the newborn exam is the primitive reflexes. When assessing them, note if they are symmetric, as asymmetry may indicate a neurologic or orthopedic condition. To test the moral reflex, hold the infant's hands and pull forward until her head is a few centimeters above the bassinet. Drop her head gently into your other hand. Her hand should open and her upper extremity should extend and then retract. The palmar grasp reflex is easily listed by pushing your fingertip into the baby's palm, causing her to wrap her fingers around yours. The rooting reflex is evaluated by stroking the infant's cheek, leading her to start suckling her mouth in anticipation of a feed. After you have completed your exam, change the diaper if dirty and re-swaddle the baby. Place her on top of the blanket, wrap one corner of the blanket around her body, fold the bottom of the blanket up toward her chest, and finally tuck the remaining side of the blanket around her and beneath her back. Thank the family for allowing you to examine their new baby and ask if they have any questions. Thank you for watching this video on the newborn exam.